So we started uh, today's class with this warm-up. We had a particle here in a box, which is our model for gases, an independent particle with speed moving freely in three dimensions, but it's inside some container, in this case our box, hence the particle in the box. And I wanted you to, I asked you, what was changing in each of these pictures? All right, what changed in each of these pictures? Well, in this first one, you can see, obviously, that we have now two particles. They have multiplied, right? And so what we have, we've uh, increased the number of particles, right? But the way we measure that is we say we've increased moles. Increased right, moles, because that's how we count particles. And the symbol for mole is n, right? So here's our symbol for moles, okay? Now in this one, we've increased the speed. But the thing with speed is that this increases the kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is temperature. Increased kinetic energy. And so that it means uh, increased temperature. And that means T, right? So we're increasing T. And lastly, we're increasing the container volume. And it's important that we're increasing the container volume because the particle itself, we assume, has negligible volume because it's an ideal gas. So we're increasing V, but we're not actually increasing the gas. We're increasing the box around the gas. Okay. Now, uh, oh, a side note on temperature. Right? Temperature formally is the average kinetic energy. Right, and ener kinetic energy is the energy of motion, right? Kinetic energy of the particles in a system. Now, it's important to recognize that Ke is equal to one half mass times speed squared, right? So when we say we're increasing the uh, speed, well, yeah, we're increasing the speed, but we're not increasing it directly, right? In other words, if we uh, increase the temperature, right, if the temperature goes up, that increases the kinetic energy, which means speed squared increases, and technically if temperature doubles, right, if we had T times 2, then the speed would be multiplied by 1.41 or something like that, which is the square root of 2, right, and then speed... Uh, right, speed squared would then be multiplied by 2, right? And so we're going to treat temperature as if temperature and speed are really the same thing. They're related, right? But uh, really temperature is a function of, of speed squared, right? So I don't know why I bring this up. It seems maybe more information than you really need to process right now. But basically I want you to think, when you think volume, I want you to think the volume of the container. When you think temperature, I want you to think speed. And when you think moles, just number of particles, okay? Now, all of this is designed to get you to think about the number of collisions that are going on. So if you think of a particle in the box and it's just rattling around there like a maraca or something like that, if I double the number of particles, I'll get more clicks per second. Instead of hearing, you know, uh, tack, 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 I hear tack, 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 right? Because I'll have more particles in there rattling around a per unit time. And so if I do this, if I increase this, I would expect this to give me more collisions. 
Okay. I would express it, I expect this to give me more collisions. Uh, let's see if I have something like this to make it more clear. All right, so more collisions, all right? And collisions has an S last I checked. All right, good, so more collisions. And then this, if I make it go faster, because now it's traveling across the box faster, it would also give me more collisions. Right, because it would cross the box at a, it would take less time to get across the container and hit the wall again, right? For the same reason, this would give me fewer collisions. Okay. And the reason it would give me fewer collisions is because now it would take twice as long to get across the container. So there would be a long pause between clicks as it uh, takes travel time to get across that container, right? So we get fewer collisions. Why do I care about collisions? Well, that's because if we think about what's actually pushing on the walls of the container, right, pressure, right, pressure, or P, is the, the frequency of collisions between the gas particles and the container wall. Right? And this is sort of a different model than you're used to thinking of, right? So now we've uh, got volume, temperature, moles, and pressure all sort of defined in our particle in the box model. And we can actually describe what's going to happen as we change things. I just really want to go back to the pressure for a second. If we think of, uh, we think of something like a balloon, right? If we think of a balloon, it's got gas inside it. But the actual total number of gas particles is relatively small. The balloon itself is held together by a tiny number of particles. Most of this is just empty space. But what's keeping it from collapsing inward is that these particles are bouncing against the walls of the container, lickety split, right? And they're keeping it pushed outward, right? There's all these collisions with these gas particles in the walls of the balloon, keeping it pushed outward, keeping it from collapsing inward. Right? And because they're moving so fast, they just rattle around, and the average um, position of the particle d defines the balloon. Right? In other words, they push, it keeps it, it pushes here, and then pushes there, and there, and there, 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 and it keeps it expanded outward. Okay? So it's those collisions that keep the balloon pushed outward. So pressure is really based on those rapid collisions between the gas particles and the walls of the container. But if you can picture these, uh, these particles in the box, you can make really good predictions about how a gas will behave. So let's try that. Let's see if we can make some sense of this. So if I think about it, now that we, right, now we've got this, and also based on that lab activity that you did the other day, uh, we know that if we compare, um, if we compare um, right, this is completely out of line here. There we go. Um, moles and pressure. Right. We know that increasing moles increases pressure. Right. The more particles you have in the box, the more collisions you have. Right. So we can call this a direct relationship. In other words, if one goes up, the other goes up. It's a direct relation. And there are two ways of looking at a direct relation. One is simply a graph. A direct relation, if I have n here and p here, simply looks like an upward sloping line. Right? As n goes up, p goes up. Well, you know that the function of a line is y equals mx plus b. But in this case, b is 0 because it's uh, at intersecting the origin. So we're instead going to write p equals k times n. There's some constant that we have to have. That's the slope. And p is equal to that constant times n. We don't really want this equation specifically because with an unknown slope in it, we, don't, we can't solve for p with you know, just having n. 
However, suppose we had initial and final conditions. If we had initial and final conditions, then P1 could equal K times N1, and P2 could equal K times N2, right? I mean, that's just what this equation implies. Well, P1 and P2 aren't equal, and N1 and N2 aren't equal, so that seems like a useless equation, except that K is a constant. And so what I can do is I can say that P1 over N1, right, so I divide both sides by N1, equals K, and P2 over N2 equals K. And if two things are equal to a, the same constant, then they're equal to each other. And so what I do is I use the equation this way. I say P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2, right? And this actually has a name. This is one way of writing what's called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. And you're, you might not see where that would be important, but if you think of our atmosphere, like if you have, um, if our room pressure uh, is, say, 760 millimeters of mercury today. I don't know if it is. Let's just assume it is. And we know that the air, uh, right, uh, is about 80% N2 and 20% uh, O2, right? That's pr a pretty good estimation of what air is. That's leaving aside some, the very small percentages, but basically air is this. So we can say like in one mole of air, you have 0.8 moles of N2 and 0.2 moles of O2, right? So you can say that the moles of N2 plus the moles of O2 equal the total moles, right? So N1 plus N2 equals N total. But we know that the proportion of pressure to moles has to be a constant. So that means that P1, since it's related to N1, plus P2, since it's related to N2, must equal P total. Right? In other words, the sum of these little pressures must be the total pressure. And in fact, they have to be in proportion to the moles. So if I know I have 760 millimeters of pressure total, right, then uh, Pn2 must equal 80% of P total, just as N, the moles of N2 are equal to 80% of n total, okay? And so that means it must equal whatever 80% of 760 is. And I would feel really proud of figuring this out in my head, except we did this in class today. And I happen to remember that it is uh, 608 millimeters of mercury, okay? And if I do the same math with P of O2, it must equal 20% of P total and it must equal whatever that is, I guess 152 millimeters of mercury. And together they add up to my 760, right? So this law, not that you care about this particular stuff, I just want to show you that there's this law and it tells us something about like things that we can picture, okay? So we have this law that's, that we're going to use as uh, there is a constant ratio of pressure to moles as long as temperature and volume are constant. So, okay, fine. We talked about pressure in moles. Well, what about temperature in moles? If we compare temp right? Well, we know that increasing T or temperature increased the pressure. Right? We know that from our particle in the box model. We increase the temperature and it increase the collisions, right? All right, good. Well, that's also a direct relation. And so it must follow the same pattern. In other words, that if I had a graph of T versus P, 
right? I should have my upward sloping function again, right? And that would mean that P is equal to K times T, right? Or if I use the same manipulation that I did before, I can say P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, right? And I call this relationship Gayla-Sachs law. I don't call it because I just create, came up with that. There was a chemist in the early 1800s and late 1700s named Gayla-Sack. Actually, that was his last name. I want to say it was, I don't know, I can't remember his first name, but uh, Joseph maybe, I don't know. Anyway, Gayla-Sack uh, was his last name, and uh, he and Dalton and a guy named Boyle and another guy named Charles did a lot of the experimentation that led to things like the atomic theory and to the this description of gas that we're doing today. So Gayla-Sack's law. Okay, And again, it means that if we have initial and final conditions, if I know the initial pressure and temperature, and I know either the final pressure or the final temperature, I can find the missing piece. Okay, So this is great. All right, so what else can we do? Well, we could, for example, compare, um, let's see, pressure and volume. Right? Because we know as volume goes up, pressure goes down. Now this is different from the other ones. Right, This one is an inverse relationship. Right? And that means that when I graph it, if I look something like this, if I have V over here and P over here, if I look at this, that means that if I... Uh, go to low volumes, I must go to high pressures, right? So I would have a point here. And if I go to low pressures, I must go to high volumes. And you're tempted to sort of connect it by a straight line, but in fact, this one is going to be asymptotic to the axes, right? It's going to have like a curve. And so it'll look something like this, where it forms this hyperbola. And it is asymptotic to both the x and y axes, right? So it looks like this, and this is an inverse relationship. In other words, that P is equal to K times 1 over V. And that one looks weirder than the other one until you realize I could multiply V times both sides, and I would get uh, P times V equals our constant. And then again, if I had initial and final conditions... then I would have P1, V1, right, and P2, V2, and they would both be equal to the same constant. So I'd have this, and I would call this law Boyle's Law. Uh, now, why do I bring up these three laws? Well, there are a bunch of reasons. One, we're going to use them a bunch, but also because if I know that P is equal to K times uh, mole n, and I know that p is equal to k times t, and I know that p is equal to k times 1 over v, and these are independent variables. In other words, that I can't derive t from v, I can't derive t from n, I can't, right? These are three independent variables. Then what I can say is I can put these all together by simply saying p must be equal to some constant. And if I wanted to, I could call this 1, 2, and 3. I don't know, you know, to make them different constants. And I could call this k4, I don't really care, times n times t over v, right? And I would have this relationship. This would be like all the three laws together. And this is a really useful relationship. In chemistry, we usually write this as, well, f um, we write this as p times v equals n times r times t, and we call this the ideal gas law. And we will talk more about this after break. This r is our constant, by the way. It's the ideal gas constant. And again, we'll talk more about this. But what I want to do is not draw big conclusions about this equation. Instead, I want to simply say, what I want you to remember is p times v over n times t is equal to a constant. And this contains all of the laws, right? If V and, say, T were constant, 
then they would essentially drop out of the equation. I could make them part of our constant. And I would simply get, well, if I look at this PV over NT, right? If V and T are constant, I can basically cross them out. And all of a sudden I have Dalton's law. So P over N equals P over N, right? P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2, right? If, uh, say, um, V and N were constant, then I would get, let's see, PV over NT, V and N, I get rid of the V, get rid of the N, and all of a sudden I have Galois-Sachs law. So P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And so this is a great way of remembering all of the relationships. What about if um, N and T were constant? Then I would have, well, I'd cross out the whole denominator, and I would have Boyle's law, P1, V1, equals P2, V2. See, I could do that. What about if I had if, what about if um, P and N were constant? Right? Then I would do the same thing, P over P, V, and T. And I would simply, okay, P and N, so I'll cross these out, and I'll get this. Uh, and uh, let's see, I would have V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Now, this is a law we haven't talked about, right? But this is true. This has to be true for the, right, by extension, right? If all these three things are true, and that creates this constant, then I can also say if these guys are constant, V should be directly related to T. And this one here is called Charles's Law. Right? Charles's Law or Charles' Law. Um, and this is what happens when you inflate a hot air balloon or when you bake bread or you, um, uh, I guess, pop popcorn to some degree. Uh, so this is when you heat something, the gas expands, right? And we can see examples of that, and I'll post uh, a couple example videos along with these notes, okay? All right, so let's do some actual problems with these, right? Because there were problems in the note packet, and I've spent a lot of time on this. So let's see what we can do. We're going to use these partial gas laws. Uh, and somewhere here, I have my note packet, and it is right up here. So let me get this guy out. By the way, I would like to point out that the note packet I supplied has these particle in the box explanations, right? And then it goes into derivations of the individual gas laws, okay? So this is all there as well, in addition to this video. Now, there are sample problems here at the end to practice. I want to uh, show how these would work. So here's a Boyle's Law problem. A sample of gas has an initial pressure of two atmospheres and an initial volume of 1.5 liters. What will happen to the volume if the pressure rises to three atmospheres? So that says pressure, so this would be like P1. An initial volume of, so this would be V1. And the pressure then changes, so this would be like P2. Well, we know that as pressure goes up, volume goes down. It's an inverse relationship, right? It's inverse. So if pressure is going up, then volume should go down. And the reason I care about this is I want you to know ahead of time what direction the answer is going so you can check your answer quickly so you can know whether you made a mistake. Anyway, so we can then say P1 V1 equals P2 V2, which is Boyle's Law. And we can put two atmospheres in times 1.5 liters equals three atmospheres times V2. And remember, we don't have to give it some fancy name. It's already a variable. We just write V2. When we want to solve this, we would divide both sides by three atmospheres, right? So we would divide by three atmospheres. And if you look at this, this cancels out. It becomes 1, right? And so we have V2 by itself on this side, 
when I have two atmospheres times 1.5 liters over three atmospheres. One thing you should notice that atmospheres divides out. So the, the unit atmospheres divides out and I know that my final answer will have the units of liters. So I get V2 equals two times 1.5 over three liters, which is actually two times 1.5 is three, three divided by three is one, so 1 1.0 liters would be our final volume. And that is less than the original 1.5, so we are correct, it decreased, okay? Now, if I try this with the second sample, uh, it says a sample of gas has an initial pressure, pressure of 200 kPa and initial volume of 120 liters, so pressure, volume, pressure and so I have the same situation I have P1 V1 equals P2 V2 so this is another Boyle's law problem and I know that it's an inverse relationship right it's inverse so if it's inverse pressure is decreased which would mean that volume should increase so I know ahead of time my final answer should be larger than my initial volume and so I get 200 kPa 200 kilopascals times 120 liters, seems like a lot of liters, equals 60 kilopascals times V2. So it's actually set up the same way because we're looking for volume again. So uh, we would divide both sides by 60, 60 kilopascals. And so at this point, kilopascals will cancel out and I'll be left with liters again. So yay us, right? Since 60 goes into 120 twice, this cancels out, this becomes just one. 60 goes into 120 twice, I would get 200 times 120 over 60. This would all have liters. 60 goes into 120 twice, twice times 200 equals 400 liters. Okay, so that'd be our final answer. I'll leave the third one for you. Let's take a look at other problems. If we look up here, we have a Charles Law practice problem, and it then has volume, so this would be like V1, and this would be like T1, right, because it's degrees Celsius, and then this volume would be, oh, so here's V2. No, no, not V2, oops, it's degrees Celsius. This is T2. How embarrassing, jumping to conclusions. So V1, T1, and T2. But still, we have a relationship of volume to temperature, and we remember V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Maybe we remember that, or maybe we want to look back at the beginning and say PV over NT equals a constant. See? I can do this, and since I need V and T, I'm ignoring P and N, and I get V over T. So I can rem if I remember that PV over NT equals a constant, I can put these laws together without having to memorize the individual ones. I then plug and chug, I get 3.5 liters, okay, uh, over, and here I'm gonna do something a little odd. Instead of writing 25 degrees Celsius, I am going to write 298.15 Kelvin, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a second. And then I will put, let's see, I don't know V2, so I'll just write V2 over, and I'll write 373.15 Kelvin, because this is 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. One thing you need to realize when we look at a graph like this is that I need, if I'm doing T and V here, right, and I have my direct relationship, in order for it to be a direct relationship, this has to be 0, 0 here. It can't be the freezing point of water. The freezing point of water is somewhere up here, right? Water freezes. This would be zero degrees Celsius. We need zero motion, not freezing of water. We need it to be like a point which you can't go below. We need the lowest possible temperature because we know that zero volume is zero space, right? So zero temperature means to be zero motion. It can't be just frozen liquid. So uh, we're going to use Kelvin. We always use Kelvin. Always, 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 always. Okay. So if I do this, I would simply multiply both sides by 373.15 Kelvin, and I would get V2 equals 
3.5 liters times 373.15 Kelvin over uh, 298.15 Kelvin. The Kelvin part will cancel out, right? And I'll be left with liters again. So V2 will equal, and I need a calculator at this point, and I have a calculator. I don't want to brag, but I have one. And I can then say, let's see, do, 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 uh, clear, 3.5 times 373.15 divided by 298.15, enter, and I get 1.38, 1.38 liters, okay, yay us, okay, now we can do the same thing where you have a balloon going from warm room to winter air. And let's see, so the temperature decreases, right? So volume should decrease as well because we know it's a direct relationship, okay? We know that, so this should definitely decrease, okay? Uh, if we put our equation, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, we can plug things in. Let's see, its initial volume is 5 liters, so 5.00 liters over, and it's starting at 30 degrees, so 30 degrees will become 303 Kelvin, right, if we round down the 0.15, right, so this is 303 Kelvin equals V2 over negative uh, 10 degrees Celsius, which would be 263 Kelvin. Got it? All right, so we do, again, Kelvin, always Kelvin. So that means that V2 will equal 263 Kelvin times 5 liters over 303 Kelvin. Kelvin cancels out, and I get 263 times 5 over 303 which, I don't know, we could probably figure out if we really, really had to. Um, I don't know. It's like 263 over 60.6. That much we know. And that looks like it would take a while to figure out. But you know it's something over, over 4, right? Because 60 goes into... 260 at least four times because that would be 240. So four with like four and a third. Let's say it's four and a third. And then let's actually calculate it. So 263 divided by 60.6. And we get 4.34. So I'm off by one one hundredth. All right, well, there we go. 4.34 liters, right? And we know it's liters because Kelvin canceled out and we left with liters. Okay, so 4.34 liters. All right, good. We have one more. And again, there's a practice problem I would like you to do on your own. So let's take a look at Gayle Sachs' law. Uh, we have temperature here, we have pressure here, and we have another temperature here. So T2. So that's T1, and that's P1, right? So we know that. Pressure is directly related to temperature. So temperature is going down, so that means that pressure should yeah, go down as well. And we can say P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And we can get that from our PV over NT relationship, right? P over T, right? P over T. And we can plug in numbers, 550 kPa, kilopascals, over 373 Kelvin, equals uh, P2, initial temperature, initial pressure, cooled, yeah, so we know P2 over 298. And we would multiply both sides by 298, and so you get P2 would equal 298 Kelvin times 550 kPa over 373 Kelvin. 
Kelvin cancels, and we will get some number, which we can figure out here as uh, 298 times 550 five divided by 373. Enter. Looks like 439. 439 uh, kPa. And we can see that, in fact, the pressure did decrease. It went from 550 to 439. So, yay. All right. Now, we can put a sample of gas in a rigid container. So, rigid container means the volume is not changing, that's for sure. It, we've got pressure, so P1. We've got T1. And we need a temperature, but we've got P2. So, we're going to use the same equation. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And we'll plug in numbers, 350 Tor over 25 degrees Celsius. But again, I need that in Kelvin, so that's going to be 298 Kelvin. 298 Kelvin equals, uh, we don't know T2, so we'll put T2 here at what temperature, and then 760 Tor. Okay, so we've got that. Now this one, because the unknown is in the denominator, uh, you can do one of two things. You can either cross multiply it, and that would be easy enough to do. We could say 350 Tor times T2 equals 760 Tor times 298K. So cross multiplying rules. However, you could also just flip both sides. And if you do that, then you'd multiply both sides by 760 and you would get uh, T2 equals the same thing we're going to get this way, 298K uh, times 760 Tor over 350 uh, Tor. So it looks like Tor is going to cancel, which will leave us with Kelvin. And we can figure out the answer by simply punching into our magic box here, 298 times 760 divided by 350. And I would like to point out that 350 is a little bit less than half of 760. So you're going to get an answer that's somewhere bigger than twice as big, right? So we should get something, if 298 is close to 300, we should get 600 in just a little bit. If we hit enter, we get 647. Well, I guess 600 and a fairly lot bit, but whatever, 647 Kelvin. Okay. And if we wanted that back in Celsius, we could then subtract our 273 minus 273.15, and we would get 374, it looks like, 374 degrees Celsius. It's pretty hot. Okay, and so again, and I'll leave a last problem for you guys to play with. Okay. Uh, were there anything else that we covered? Yes, there were, actually. And let me call this up on my computer screen. I'm pretty sure that we had some problems in the other, in the packet that I went over as well. So I want to call up those. Um, let's see, honest chemistry and gas laws. And day one. So... Yeah, and on that, if we went to the end of the packet, we had practice problems. Uh, we know, and so I will call up a couple of these just to make sure that we've gone over these. Um, right. Um, there was some problem like with temperature conversion uh, where we said we had soup at... 290 Kelvin. Uh, what was its temperature in Celsius? And if you recall, Kelvin equals Celsius plus 273.15. And so that would mean that Celsius is equal to Kelvin minus 273.15. And so we can say 290 uh, Kelvin equals degrees C plus 273.15, or degrees C would equal, when we subtract from both sides, it looks like just about 17 degrees Celsius. 
So that's pretty chilly soup. Okay? But we can convert back and forth using this relationship. Another thing that we did uh, was pressure conversion. And for example, uh, soda, we said, is bottled um, at 325 kPa. And we wanted to know how many atmospheres that was. Well, if I have a problem like this, I need some um, values that are equal. I mean, it turns out that standard pressure is given to you on page two of your notes. And standard pressure would be one ATM or one atmosphere, right? Uh, or 101.325 kilopascals, right? Or 760 millimeters of mercury, right? In a barometer, we would use mercury to measure the pressure. And again, you can read all about it in your packet on page two. But here's a chart, okay, that we would use that you would need to have access to. Then it's just a matter of doing factor label, 325 kilopascals times a fraction bar equals some number of ATM. I would put kilopascals down below, kPa. I would put atmospheres up above, ATM. I would look at my handy chart and put a one here because it's equal to 101.325 down here, right? And now I know I would divide by 101.325 and multiply by 1, and I'd get something like 3.24 or something like that. And I would check using my handy calculator. So I'd say uh, 325 divided by 101.325 would give me 3.21 ATM. Right? And so I'd get an answer. All right. Last but not least, in the problem, they talked about the ideal gases. Right, the last few problems. And one of them said ideal gases, they pointed out the ideal gas, the first rule of ideal gases is that they have no attractions or repulsions. And so if we think about if we had like ionic compounds, right, or, uh, you know, metals or nonpolar covalent or polar covalent or network covalent, which of these uh, would be the most likely to behave like an ideal gas? And if they have no attractions, we know that nonpolar compounds have the weakest attractions, right? They have London dispersion forces or van der Waals, if you want to call them van der Waals forces, um, and they're the weakest, right? So we would expect that nonpolar covalent compounds would behave the most ideal. It would be the most ideal gases, okay? But we can go further than that. We know that London dispersion forces get get stronger with molar mass, right? Increased molar mass, right? So we want weaker, so that means they should be low molar mass, right? And in class, we compared the noble gases, right? We would say helium has the least molar mass of any of the noble gases, so it would behave the most ideally. Um, we also talked about whether, even if it has interparticle forces, um, we would like those particle, those forces to be as weak as possible. So we would like the gases to be spread out, right? Uh, we would want them to be far apart. And the way to make them far apart would be like to increase the volume and decrease the pressure, right? right, at high volume or low pressure. We'd also want them to be moving quickly. So high temperature. 
So if we think of it, you know, just because we want the to minimize the interaction between the particles, have them move quickly so that they don't have time to interact, have them far apart because that weakens the attraction, have their masses small because that makes the attraction the weakest, and then make them uh, nonpolar covalent because those have the weakest style of attraction. So these are just ways of thinking about real substances and their attractions and repulsions. So that should take us through the practice problems from the first packet. And that should set us up pretty nicely. Okay, when we get back from break, uh, like that week, I will collect your note packets and you should have the practice problems in both of these packets uh, finished. Okay. Even the ones that I didn't do. Just saying. So let's call that a day. And let's see if I can do this. Um, somehow there's a way of doing this. Oh, here it is.